everything gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and you want more lights and more camera and more lens and you just get to a certain point where you just start lighting things with a bulb right or a window yeah and it just looks good we're rolling are we still rolling yeah okay sick cool welcome everybody hi everyone how you doing dev i'm doing probably better than you are right now probably probably you had a rough day yesterday huh yeah i spent the night in the hospital yeah so what was that all about man i had vertigo crazy vertigo i woke up uh vomiting and at like 4 a.m and i was like going in and out of consciousness and then the next thing i remember i was in an ambulance and they took me to the hospital and i was in and out got some scans apparently you have little crystals in your ear and when those crystals become dislodged and I've had a lot of concussions and I think it's like prone, you know, Mm -hmm. people who have had a lot of concussions can, this can happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess the crystals got dislodged in my ear. It sounds like bullshit, but it's real. It totally sounds like bullshit. There was this guy who came in, they did all these tests, all these doctors trying to convince me of all this nonsense. And then this guy came in, I, I was like, give me the PT, like, tell me about these crystals. And he came in and like did some head turning things, laid me down, whatever. And like, I was like 40% better, like an hour later. Yeah. That's crazy. insane. So it's all about just like recalibrating them, realigning them. Yeah. It's like realigning your chakra. I guess. Like crystals. Yeah. I don't know. It's, yeah. It's, it sounds like horseshit. It sounds sure. insane. Yeah. But, but it's real. You actually yeah. have crystals in your inner ear. Yeah. And they can, they can get out of whack and like you do these simple maneuvers and yeah. like, I'm still a little wobbly, like I'm still a little loopy, but much better. Yeah. That's like good. after <laughs> this guy just like turned my head a few times and laid me down and sat me up. Yeah. But it was like six hours of just like straight vomiting and then like passing out and then waking up and like the room spinning and everything was on a tilt. It was nuts, man. Yeah. That sucks, man. Yeah. Yeah. So you woke up feeling just everything was spinning and you're just crazy vertigo nausea and then you went and like woke up your dad and yeah and he told me just you just passed out you just like fell on the floor yeah and he was freaked out yeah he thought i was dead yeah like he and then i just woke up like just spewing vomit everywhere and he's like uh i'm gonna call the ambulance i guess like i don't know like ems came they hooked all these crazy diodes up to me and they're like taking all these you know tests and yeah yeah, ended up in the hospital. Yeah. So here we are. Here we are. We're talking about gear now. Talking about gear. Every filmmaker's favorite thing to talk about. Yeah. The funny thing is, is that when you and I first met, we were both like videographers, you know, doing like the one man videographer thing. Mm-hmm. But like, I just remember how weird it was. Like, we kind of talked about this in a previous podcast, but like, we were both running almost the exact same camera down to like the same memory cards. Like mm-hmm. it was like the same Zion crane, the same mics, the same everything. Same it was monitors. Like, we had like the Ninja Five. Yeah. Everything still was the same. Yeah. But it was just, that to me was so crazy because after like meeting up with you again and like just how everything happened and like how our lives like converged again and then like talking yeah. about gear and just the way we shot and the way we, everything. It was like very... We were very synchronized in that way. Like, we just yeah. had so much in common. I was like, this is bizarre, man. It was also, I think, a lot of the um, the creators and the filmmakers that we both looked up to. Like, we kind of had the same... We had our, like, eyes... We were watching the same things and yeah. learning from a lot of the same people. So I think that probably had a lot to do with it as well. Yeah. Which is cool. But yeah, we did. And that made things a lot easier mm-hmm. when we were shooting. Because, yeah. obviously different cameras have different color science and so different lenses have different tints and and things like that. So having the same equipment really made things interchangeable. So when we started working together, it was, it was really nice because we, in essence, we just doubled our equipment for any given project, which is cool. So all the footage was matched. It was easy to color. Like that was, yeah, that was great. Um, so I think that like having the same taste, even in gear really helped like our workflow together, even yeah. when, as we started to buy more gear and look at different things, like we started, we kind of were thinking in the same direction, mm-hmm. you know, when we wanted to do 
larger productions, like we moved in, we both really wanted to shoot anamorphic. Yeah. And our buddy Ryan is like, he's like a gear enthusiast. He's like a techie guy. He's always looking at yeah. all that shit. And this like, is Ryan's studio, by the way. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Ryan. Yeah. Shout um, out. So yeah, Black Magic, like we ended up wanting to get like a cinema camera, something that shot raw. Um, because right, cause we started on Sony's. We started on yep. um, A6500, A6300, A7 III. Yep. That's what we were, we were using. Mm -hmm. And a Mavic 2 Pro drone. Mm -hmm. And like you talked about, all the other equipment too. Um, gimbals were the same. The Zhiyun yep. Crane V2 or whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> all that stuff was the same. And at the time too, we were both, um, we both kind of getting tired of the whole gimbal, par parallaxing every shot. Yeah. It right. just felt stale. You know, mm -hmm. and um, everyone kind of start was already doing that. And it was kind of already popular for a while, and it just it just felt like what everyone else was doing. And I think we got to a point too where we just wanted to challenge ourselves a little bit more, try you know doing some more handheld work and and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of along the that's kind of what brought us up to even looking at the Black Magic cameras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Black Magic, you know, we were we were doing a bunch of research to try to figure out the cheapest possible camera that's going to give us the best image and also be able to shoot anamorphic. And the cool thing about black magic at the time was it was a micro four thirds lens. And this company called Vazen had just come out with a set of micro four thirds, like true anamorphic mm -hmm. lenses. And they were like way cheaper than a lot of the atlases or the cooks or, you know, any of the vintage anamorphics. Yeah. So for, you know, $3,000, you had, you know, your 28 mil anamorphic, you know, I think the, the lenses, the package of the lenses is like nine grand or something, right. which is still pricey for like a couple of videographers trying to figure it out. But yeah, you know, the atlases go nine, 10,000 per lens. And so we could get that, that look, that anamorphic look in shooting raw footage with that black magic. Right. And it's true anamorphic. It's yeah. just like actual anamorphic, which is mm -hmm. really cool because there's ways to obviously get a similar look but unless you're shooting through the actual anamorphic glass i mean you're just never really going to get that characteristic which was cool it didn't i think ryan had the set first right we started borrowing his because and you said we did some research we did some research but we pretty much ryan is like a researcher mm -hmm. so he's like any anything he buys you know that he's done his due diligence he's looked through every single review he's looked at every other option and so we know if he chooses something that's probably the best one. Yeah. So we kind of just steal his research. <laughs> yeah, we did. And it works great. Yeah. Um, and, and it's funny, like when we were like videographers and stuff, like we knew the type of stuff we wanted to shoot. And there's like a, there's like, there's optics that go along with, with your setup. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, so we were like, we need, we want a big camera. We want something, you know, you're talking like V mounts and like a fully rigged kind of cinema camera which for better or for worse does go a long way with clients. Yeah. Like everyone, like they look at the camera and they're, they're you know, like, Oh shit. Like this guy must be serious. Like yeah, he's, it's the optics. For it's, sure. Yeah. It does play a part. Right. And a little bit of vanity. You yeah, know? exactly. Like you want to be a real filmmaker. With exactly. A real cinema rig. But those things all, there is a purpose for all of those things. There's a purpose for the size of a camera like that. Obviously right. it's not just the body itself. It's, everything that goes along with it. It's the monitor, like you said, it's the V-mount battery and everything that it takes to power your focus motor and all that stuff. So it, it all serves a purpose, mm -hmm. but it ends up looking really badass. So yeah. that's yeah. cool too. Yeah. And those Black Magics, I mean, we beat the hell out of those things. Mm -hmm. I think we bought one and we were just borrowing a second one for like B-cam and interviews and things whenever we would need it. Um, and I feel like that was kind of the start of like building our gear out you yeah. know from yeah. there like it was um i think you and i both prior to the black magics bought uh we each bought one of the 60 watt godox lights that's right yeah with like the cheap like newer c stands or whatever and i remember that being like a big deal yeah for sure yeah at, yeah we were starting to get into lighting a lot more too mm -hmm. um well so like you said we only had one of those cameras we had one of you know, everything that it took to make one of those cameras work. And I don't advise that. We've gotten really, really lucky, really lucky somehow with our equipment. I don't know how, but we have always just somehow gotten by with having 
the bare minimum that we need mm-hmm. to make it happen, at least for the first year or two. Like we had just enough, you know, so, but if something broke, we were screwed. Yeah. You know, there's that saying two is one and one is none. Well, on a shoot like that is true. You know, if something goes down and it's your only one, no good. So yeah, we would borrow and stuff, but not for every shoot. I know there's a lot of shoots that we just had one who had one camera and yep. if that thing decides to not work that day, it's, you know, it's just not good. And especially not good in front of a client right. when there's money on the line and you're, you know, you're just, you're trying to make something happen for them. You want to come through. So, um, mm-hmm. I wouldn't advise having one of really of anything, to be honest, if you can get to, if you have the ability to do it do it because it's just it's always good to have a backup so yeah just wanted to throw that in there yeah 100 percent. yeah and i feel like from there like a lot of our gear just kind of slowly built up over time and a lot of it was just per project you know and we were learning so much on how how like the shoots we wanted to do like how to make those look the way we wanted them to look and i feel like every single shoot we had for that first year like we would buy a new piece of equipment for that yeah. shoot because like we would have some new technique that we wanted to try and, and, you know, we would always, whatever that budget was for the client, we would always put that, you know, we would always make sure that we, we purchased something inside of that budget yeah. to kind of build that up. And it right. just kind of a lot of lighting, a lot of grip, um, yeah. a, like m- different gimbals, rails, things like that. Yeah. Um, steady cam, all that stuff. Um, that, and that brings up a, like a good point because, so for every project we did, any money we made, and it's true to le- even to this day, I mean, not to the same extent maybe, but um, we would put money right back into the business. That was our way of putting money into the business was was buying new equipment. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of people talk about this. Alex Ramosi says it a lot. You know, you, the best thing you can do is invest in yourself. Mm-hmm. And that was one version of us doing that. You know, obviously um, you want to keep learning and, and invest in whatever, you know, training programs, things like that resources like that but uh putting money back into the company in in the form of equipment was was big for us Mm -hmm. and it's something that uh, we still do um but especially in the beginning when we were building that initial kit like you really need to do that and i think um, i'm glad we did it you know um because obviously you could pay yourselves that money Mm -hmm. and make more money that month you know but um it's a good discipline i think to get into is to always take it doesn't have to be all of it, obviously, but just always taking something and putting it back in the business in whatever form. But as a filmmaker, um, investing in equipment, equipment that you need, yep. which is a big thing too, you mm-hmm. know, because there's a lot of stuff that we've purchased over the years that honestly, we spent a lot of money on it and, and we didn't use it, you know. Yeah. Um, I can think of a few things right now off the top of my head, you know, there's there's been some, you know, even like investing in a big client monitor, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's great on the times that we've used it, but like that thing's expensive. Yeah. And for the most, most of the time it sits around and we don't rent our equipment out really. We, we do once in a while, but for the most part we don't, we're not like a rental house. So some of the purchase we purchases we've made, um, you know, you, you realize that you didn't actually need it, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, it was just, that's the thought I had. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for me, like, obviously you took the director role, I took the DP role. So um, as far as like investing in myself, like for anybody out there who's looking to like better themselves as a DP, um, I took a ton of courses. Mm-hmm. I took a lot of the buff nerd stuff. I took different coloring courses and like the best course that I ever took was by the wandering DP. Mm-hmm. The wandering DP has, I think three or four different courses. Um, and that was really where like a lot of my skills started to shine because yeah. he's so in depth. He's a he's a proper DP on large productions and just has a great way of breaking everything down into like a framework essentially and how you shoot those things, what that looks like. And it really like started getting me excited about like developing that look, yeah. you know, on set. And I feel like, so every time I take his course, I would learn so much and I'd be like, okay, well, we need this and we need this and we need this. And this is how we can make this look like this. Cause we both knew what we wanted. Yeah. It was just figuring out how to make that happen, you know, and, and starting to understand like a 60 watt led isn't going to cut it when you're competing against the sun or you're competing against, you know, whatever windows or things like that, yeah. being able to properly light an interior. And what does that look like? And, and I think that was like his course, 
uh, really helped me develop my skill as a DP and mm -hmm. really understand like how to properly light some of these things and get granular with, with developing a look, right. you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, yeah, especially as a DP, but even as a director too, like knowing like you went, you took a deep dive into that stuff. I'm, I mean, I'm just typically not as interested in some of those technical aspects and even like, to be honest, even equipment, I kind of just, it got boring to me, mm -hmm. um, especially just because I knew like, it cost a lot of money. And if there's something that we needed, you know, it's going to cost some money. So, but the cool thing about it was even just in us creatively talking about a project, you know, if one of us had an idea or say, if I had an idea and I didn't know how to achieve that, I'd be able to come to you and say like, Hey, what if we did it this way? What if we, how do we get this look right here? Mm -hmm. And you had the tools, you know, based on that course and what you learned to say, well, we need this, this, and that. Mm -hmm. um, we can we can do with what we have here, but we need to rent this, or yep. maybe we should look at actually investing in this because it'd be something that we'll use a lot. Mm -hmm. So it's really good to be able to have that, just even for the creative process. Yeah, to be able to really talk through things and um, you know start to figure out what's going to allow us to get those looks that are in our heads. You yeah, know, or those things if we've seen you know whatever on shot deck or something. Yep. some inspiration that we have that we're trying to achieve or get close to it yep. you know you have to you have to know how to get there and that course i think really did that for you i mean yeah. i saw a huge improvement a huge change in just your overall knowledge base when it came to lighting mm -hmm. through that you know like i could see it mm -hmm. it'd be like from shoot to shoot it's like you're picking up a new tip or trick and then we're able to go try it out which mm -hmm. is which is fun too because it's like you're you're experimenting on on shoots and you're always trying to push it you're always trying to do something a little bit cooler you know something change something about it yep. do something that you're a little uncomfortable with but maybe maybe you just learned it you want to try it out it's the cool thing about you know um making films is you get to do that on shoots yeah you know and it, it keeps you inspired and creative yeah yeah and something i've learned as like a dp um and a lot of like a lot of our shoots you know it's like it's a smaller crew so you kind of wear multiple hats dp gaffer yeah. grip you know there's you're 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 wearing multiple hats on these shoots. And something that I've learned through buying gear and going to more shoots and, and trying to execute these things is you're you're always one light short. Mm -hmm. No matter what, you're always just short of what you want to achieve. No matter how much gear we've bought, because it's like you, you keep learning, then you buy these, you know, the gear you need, you get to the shoot, and like you always realize that like, man, if I just had this, if I just had this, we could get it there. And that doesn't, that seems to never end. Like you hear it from the the biggest DPs in in Hollywood is just like, no matter what the budget is, like you never quite have what right. you want to fully achieve that thing. And yeah. and that's what, you know, that's that's the, the nature of this, this industry, right? It's like you do the best with what you have. It's like we started with 260 watt LEDs and we were able to shoot the hell out of things with it. Yeah. It didn't quite you know some windows had to be blown out at times and like we you know but you do the best with what you have yeah and right now like our lighting package is i think we have uh we have the nova p300 we have still have a bunch of those godox they're holding on by a thread yeah we have um, all of them still yeah yeah i one can't of them, believe it one of the the leds is cracked it still works but yep. yeah yeah so we have those we have uh the aperture 600 yeah and we have uh, the Nanlite uh, tubes. Yeah. And I think that we have like some other small lights, like just little accessory lights for, for small little things, details and stuff. But for the most part, those have gotten us through quite a bit. And then you can get into your fabrics and diffusions and how to use all of those. And, and we have different claws, half grid and quarter grid and full grid. Yeah. Eight buys and things like that, that definitely help. But it's like a lot of those things are great, but they're only as good as the knowledge you have to be able to use them. Right. You know what I mean? Like if you, th like if just going out and buying all that stuff, you know, understanding what a half grid is going to do versus a quarter grid versus a full grid versus a magic cloth. It's like, those are all things that like you just develop over time. You know what I mean? And And even still today, it's like when we, go to light something it's like oh i know that we need this for this but we don't have it and we're just going to use a half grid instead and it looks fine but it's like it's just the the further you get into 
like having the experience of of understanding the minutia of lighting, mm -hmm. you know, the better you can use those tools. Right, because it really is in those details. Yeah. It's in those small, like, percentage increases, you know, that things really start to pop. Yeah. You know, it's just enough of those things they add up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like, you know, there's another thing, too. Obviously, in this industry, um, renting is a big thing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, renting allows you to to scale up or down according to the project, right? So you don't have to necessarily front the cost of all the equipment and own the equipment and house the equipment and take care of it. You can rent, mm -hmm. you know? So that's, so for especially larger productions, that standard is for, um, you know, for you to rent, mm -hmm. whether it's lighting or even camera bodies, lenses is a big one. Um, we kind of made a decision early on that we wanted to at least have enough equipment to get us through what might be like our typical shoot so that, we could say yes to a project and be shooting it that day or the next day, mm -hmm. you know? So we didn't necessarily have to wait on rentals. We do rent often um, for larger projects, but we, we knew we wanted to at least have our own kit that we could, like I said, just say yes to something and be able to do it the next day, keep us flexible. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's been really helpful. And I think our even our current setup, of course, we could always use more and there's always, you're always one light shy of what you need. But I feel like we got a pretty good, package right now where yeah. you know we're able to kind of just show up to location and have the tools that we need um to be able to get the job done yeah um so let's talk a little bit about uh camera and uh, let's talk actually a little bit more about um stabilization mm -hmm. so when we started like i said we were using these really cheap uh gimbals kind of got tired of the parallaxing on every shot and the the gimbal look because there's a certain look that it, that you get using uh, like a three-axis gimbal mm -hmm. So we decided to get, it wasn't like an official steady cam, but it was something like it. It was a fly cam, right? Yeah. So um, when we were looking into that, I mean, what was, as DP camera op, what did you like about the, uh, the fly rig and what did you not like about it? <laughs> uh, well, there wasn't much that I loved about it, to be honest with you. Yeah, it was a pain in the ass. It sucked. That thing sucked. And it mostly because... Like a lot of those steady cams, like a proper steady cam, like you're looking at a, like 10 grand to start, you know, like they're for a proper rig, you know. Um, and we ended up kind of cheaping out on mm -hmm. this fly cam, which is definitely made for like, you know, five to eight pound DSLRs. And at this point, I think our camera was like 16 pounds or something like that. Yeah. So with the anamorphic lenses, which are five pounds each, you know, they're heavy lenses. So like, it was impossible to balance. Like it was, we figured it out and we had to modify some things to make it work. Mm -hmm. But it was such a chore to, it took so much time on set yeah. to get to get it ready, like to get it. I remember there was like a shoot, um, well we did like the Gamby shoot we mm -hmm. had talked about and that was a mess. We tried to use it. That was the first time we ever tried to use it. Oh, was it? It was on that shoot and it was yeah. terrible. I don't think we used any of those shots. Yeah. Um, Cause it's, it's hard to do as well. It's not yeah. an easy, it's not an easy rig to, to use. Right. I mean, it takes, and that's why there's literal steady cam operators. They, that's what they do as, as a career. Yeah. They do steady cam. Mm -hmm. So it takes a long time to get good at it. Yeah. And especially if you're using some cheap one, like the one that we had <laughs> yeah. that, that had like the payload was too, too heavy. And yep. yeah. So, yeah, we, the, there was one shot. This is right before I think we got rid of it. Um, it was for IMG Academy. Mm -hmm. It was the golf, it was a golf piece. Yep. And it was like the opening shot and we had, had it all planned out where it like panned up from the grass mm -hmm. yeah, and she it. was like putting her stuff down It panned around her yeah. and then she, you know, drove the ball. It was a nice little one -er. yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was like a little one take that we wanted to do. And we finally, like at that point we had finally gotten it to work well enough, but still like setting that up for that shot, you know, it took 40 minutes to mm -hmm. get the thing balanced and, and then take after take after take, you know, it wasn't like a one take and we're done. It's like choreographing everything and then the steady cam would have a little wobble in it. We'd have yep. to start over. And yeah, it wasn't a great piece of equipment right. for what we had. For yeah. Sure. And so, with, like with a steady cam, the look that it gives you, um, it's not like a clinical stabilization, like what a gimbal would give you. Yeah. It does have some flow. Yep. So, it does have a little bit of wobble in the horizon, you know. And obviously, the, the more talented you get with it, the more practice you have with it, you can kind of 
minimize yeah. some of that, but it does, it's not perfect. Yeah. And it's supposed to kind of more glide, mm -hmm. right? I guess that would be the best way of saying it. Yeah. It gives you a nice glide and it does allow for, I think, smoother pans and things like that. And, yep. and even tilts too, like you talked about that shot from starting at the grass and going up. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain look to it yep. that I love. I mean, I still, I really love when it's done well. And, mm -hmm. and I think we've we've gotten pretty close on, on some shoots to where it was like, mm -hmm. oh, that looked that's what we were going for, you yeah. know, but it is hard. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not like an easy thing to do and it's heavy and, and takes time. Yeah. And it, yeah, on set it's, it, it, it was a huge time killer mm -hmm. for a lot of shoots. Yeah. And, but I feel like, I don't know, I think a lot of our gear selection wasn't necessarily for speedy shoots. It was right. like, no, we're looking for a certain look mm -hmm. and we will sacrifice <laughs> to get that look, yep. you know, putting a honking anamorphic lens on a, on a camera and you know, this, this fly rig, like that, these things are not, they're not meant for it just to be easy and get, get the shot quickly. It's meant to get a certain aesthetic, a certain look and a feel. Yeah. So, um, and that typically kind of goes into most of the equipment we buy. I mean, especially back then it was like, what's going to look the best? What's going to be like the coolest, give us the coolest vibe. Right. And it's usually a pain in the ass. Yeah. Yeah. It usually is. And I feel like we've, you kind of go through these cycles and like, not that we've gotten here at all, but, but I remember hearing like Roger Deakins talking one time and he's like, you know, you, as a filmmaker, like you build, everything gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and you want more lights and more camera and more lens and all of this stuff. And then he's like, you just get to a certain point where you just start lighting things with a bulb right, or a window yeah, and it just looks good. And yep. it's like, at some point, like you, you've learned everything that you can learn. You know, someone like Roger Deakins mm -hmm. has been doing it for ages. Yeah. He's the best in the game. It's like, he talks about certain shots and he's like, we tried a bunch of things and I walked away for 10 minutes and I came back and I turned on the incandescent bulb and that's how we shot it. Yeah. You know, and, and it's like, or lit a candle. Exactly. Just, yeah. Lit it with the candlelight. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, obviously there's wisdom in that. You for know sure. what I mean? Yeah, there's times sure. where, you know, they shoot Blade Runner and you have to have, you know, 500 sky panels sitting over, yep. you know, a, a studio set. But, you know, it's, it's about like what, how can you do the most with the least? Right. You know? Yeah. That's funny. You, br you brought up uh, Roger Deakins too, because Scott and I were actually just talking about this. Um, there's kind of this ongoing beef. I don't know if it's, it's it seems like more of a one-sided beef, but between Quentin Tarantino and Roger Deakins, it's the film versus digital debate that's been going on. Mm. Um, you know, obviously Quentin Tarantino he shoots everything on film. He tries, you know, he wants everything projected on film. He's just a purist in that way. Mm -hmm. Roger Deakins has gone the other direction. You know, obviously he started shooting film, of mm -hmm. course, but now, you know, he's, he's using Alexa minis and things like that. And, you know, I think they both make their points, but I got it. I, I honestly, I just have to, I think I agree a lot more with Roger Deakins because what the, this all ends up being, especially, you know, with the digital camera and maybe less lighting and things like that, it allows you to get more. It allows you to tell more of the story. Mm -hmm. It's the tool f to tell your story. So you said like, we kind of go through these phases too. We went through that phase, I think, of trying to be a little bit more purist with it mm -hmm. and and sacrificing for it. And yeah. by sacrifice, I mean sacrificing time on set that we could have been using shooting, Yeah. Um, which I think is cool. And we got some cool stuff. But I'm honestly, you know, the pendulum for me has swung to where I'm like, <laughs> the more we can get, the faster we can capture the magic, you know, and the more flexibility we have, mm -hmm. I think the better. Yeah. You know, I think I'm... Um, starting to become less of a purist. Obviously you still want that look and yep. I get all that, yep. you know, I still love all of that, but it's, I think you just go through enough shoots where, you know, you're like, man, we missed this or we, miss, you know, we, we weren't thinking creatively because we were thinking technically and we were thinking about how to fix this issue mm -hmm. with, you know, with whatever was broken. Yep. So yeah, it's just interesting because we were literally just talking about that. And yeah, I, I, I have to say, I agree with Roger Deakins, you know, whatever allows you to tell the story and to, to capture more of the magic on the day, I think yeah. is the way to go. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. I was listening to something earlier. It was like, again, like everything goes through phases, right? Like I think lenses, even lenses like have gotten faster and faster and faster, you know, to where you're shooting at a 1.2 or whatever. And everyone's looking for that crazy depth of field and, uh, that narrow focus range or whatever. Um, 
and I was just listening to somebody talk about uh, 1917. Mm -hmm. And they're like, 1917 was shot on a 35 millimeter lens at 5.6 mm -hmm. the entire time. Spherical too. Yeah. Yeah. At a 5.6. Yeah. You know, and like everything, everyone always wants to shoot wide open. Mm -hmm. It's like wide open, wide open, wide open. But it's like some of the biggest filmmakers out there they're shooting at an F4 or an F5 or whatever. And it's like the whole movie is shot on an F5.6. Yeah. Like that's crazy. You know, like that's, and that's the best in the game doing that. And I bet know? the production designer was really happy about that. I'm because sure more were. of the set was seen. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's something to that. It's like when you first start, you, you're trying to get the thing that you've never been able to achieve. You're yeah. trying to capture the thing in the way you've never been able to do it before, which is usually like, like you said, that shallow depth of field and that nice bokeh, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, it's all about that separation. And then you start to realize like, well, there is story to be told in the background, mm -hmm. you know? So sometimes you want to see those things, yep. you know? So you don't necessarily have to shoot wide open all the time. Right. Um, it's a nice look. Mm -hmm. It's great for some things, but um, yeah, I just feel like, I mean, I'm guilty of that. Like in the beginning, it was like, oh, I want to get that, that nice, just mm -hmm. like smeary bokeh in the background. And, you know, it's because it was that thing I, I always felt like I couldn't do. You right. Know, like I don't have a camera that will do that, but that will look good right. in that way, you know? So yeah, it's just funny how things change. Well, they're all tools, right? Right. Like that's it. It's just a tool. Like yeah. there's a time and place to shoot at one, two, and there's a time and place to shoot at five, six. And it's like, that's, that all goes into the visual storytelling. Right. You know what I mean? It's like not every shot needs to be wide open where you can't tell where they are, what's going on. It's like there is a time and place for that. But if it doesn't serve the story, then like all those things need to be considered when when you're shooting instead of just going like, well, I'm going to make it look like this because this is the cool thing that people are doing right now. Right. You know, and it's just it's a tool. It's yeah. a tool that you you can use however you want to use it, you know, and, and I think that's what we tend to forget sometimes. Right. Because YouTube is telling us that it needs to look like this or it needs to be this or this is what's cool. And, and I mean, I'm guilty as anybody else, you know, of that, you yeah. know, just like open the lens wide open, throw an ND on it and, and you shoot everything at that, at that depth of field. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's, it's funny how things change. So we have, so we were using a lot of that, um, the fly rig the kind of steady cam style thing. Mm -hmm. Um, we, and we were also for almost every shoot for a couple of years there, we would have someone pull in focus for us. Yep. Um, that's kind of changed, mm -hmm. especially recently. Yeah. You know, one of the reasons being we've been doing a lot more documentary work. So, um, and we have a camera with autofocus, yeah. which is cool. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, what do you tend to gravitate towards these days in terms of, um, stabilization? And then obviously we know we're using a lot of autofocus, but, um, Let's just talk, I guess, the gimbal we're using now because we have kind of come full circle and we are we have been for a lot of shoots using gimbal again. Yeah. Yeah, we've we've been using the Zion uh, Crane 3S, I think. Yeah. Which, again, is like, it's like a cheap movie, kind of. It's, technology's crazy because it's like they come out with, you know, your Ronins and all of these, like, expensive, which have their place. You know, they have features that this one doesn't, but for people who are still learning and growing, it's like now you can mount a 15 pound camera on the Zion crane. And then we got like the roll cage for it. So it's easier to, to manage. Um, a lot of our stuff now is when we do gimbal work, it's shot Zion crane with the, the cage on it and it's shot on a one wheel. Mm -hmm. So we bought yeah. a one wheel, which is a game changer. Oh, yeah. Like as ridiculous as it is sometimes, like, it has gotten us shots that we could have never gotten before. Yeah, you want to talk about production value? Yeah. And the best way to up your production value instantly, get a one wheel. It's so smooth. Yeah. Like it's so steady. And obviously, like like you said, like there's a difference between a gimbal and a and a steady cam. You know, like you're able you're much more flexible with a steady cam. Like if you know how to use it, you can easily pan to get your shot. You can e it's so much more versatile in that way. Yeah. But that's why DPs, if they're camera opping for their handheld or crane, you know, uh, shots, they'll bring in that steady cam operator for those shots specifically because it's not something that you can just jump onto. Right. Where like a gimbal is a little bit more flexible in that way. Still takes some work, 
but not nearly as much as as Steadicam. Like it's such a specialized piece of equipment that like is is it's very specialized for for that type of operator to right. be able to do that. Yeah, and it has its faults. I mean, we did a shoot recently that the gimbal gave us some issues. Yeah. And it took a good chunk of, of the day just trying to figure that out. Not of the day, but it took probably an hour. Yeah. Um all said and done throughout the day of yeah. just wasted time just trying to figure out this gimbal um the balancing on it. Yeah. And so yeah, they all have their pros and cons for sure. Yeah, it's if you're looking for that shot, if you have time for that shot, a lot of times, honestly, like with docu style stuff, with things that like we just had a small crew for, we didn't have time for, we were like looking for certain light outside, whatever it was, like I would just jump on a handheld rig with the one wheel. Yeah. And that does wonders like that's it's not a perfectly steady shot but it's easy to be able to get a lot quickly mm -hmm. you know for instance like if someone's cycling next to you and you're following them on the one wheel it's like it's so easy to like be able to one it's nice because you you do get a little bit of that handheld still and and you feel like you're kind of in the moment with the kinetic energy of cycling it's yeah. you know you're moving quickly but like being able to just pan down to the wheel and then being able to pan up to the handlebars and then being able to pan up to their face and then backing off and getting a wide shot. And like you have so much flexibility there. And it actually, I tend to like it better for a lot of the shots that we get mm. because it does feel a little bit more kinetic in that way. Like yeah. you feel like you're with them on that bike going through what they're going through, Yeah, um, which is a really good combination. You know, it's yeah. you're not running, so it's not so jarring which sometimes that works too, um, actually works really well uh, in a lot of ways. Like we did a lot of that where it's just like, it's just messy. You're letting it be messy. You're just running alongside of them. The camera's going crazy. Um, those are really good cutaway shots to have. Yeah. Um, but that one wheel with the handheld uh, rig is, especially if like your lens has in-body stabilization or the mm -hmm. camera does, like that'll help too. But again, they're all tools to tell the story. That's yeah, it. That's totally. all you're doing. Like one's not better than the other. It just depends on the story you want to tell and how you want to tell it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that one wheel too, by the way, we're talking about going off road with it, going down bumpy trails. Yeah. And it, the thing is a game changer. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so we, you know, over the course of three years accumulated all this equipment and, um, you know, it, we got very tired of one having it all in our side office. It was just a mess in there. Mm -hmm. it was just you couldn't walk through it. It was just you know, it looked like a bomb went off. And two, anytime we had a shoot, we'd have to load it all out into like my Xterra or your truck and bring it to the shoot. And inevitably, we would forget something. There'd yeah. be like one thing that we needed that was like hidden away somewhere at the office, under a couch or wherever. Yeah. It was like constant. It was like almost every single shoot. It was like, we always forget one thing. And it's not just like one random thing. It's the one thing that we absolutely need right. in that moment. It's your ND filter, your memory card, or something that yeah. does like makes the shoot work. Yes. You know? Yeah, something crucial. And, um, and that happened, you know, going out of town as well. Yeah. You know, we'd forget there'd be one thing and you wouldn't be close to, a, you know, whatever best buy or whatever you can't yeah. even get that stuff from best buy but whatever. you wouldn't be close to anywhere that would sell that yeah so it just became a huge pain in the ass and um we had started looking around for you know different vehicles that we could we could purchase um so that we'd have a place that all of our equipment could fit and we'd be able to actually just drive it to a shoot and know that we didn't forget anything yeah so we i think we started first looking at like sprinter vans maybe mm -hmm. um just kind of build out like a grip truck yep and Somehow that turned into a box truck, I think. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think I think I found it on YouTube. We talked a little bit about like, well, what are some other trucks that could work? So I was doing some YouTube search and this company in, are they in North Dakota? Yeah, yeah. North Dakota. North Dakota. They had, they had uh, taken an old ambulance. Shout out threefold. <laughs> threefold, yeah. We got to have them on the podcast sometime. Mm -hmm, yes. Yeah. Good guys. Um, they had done the, they had retrofitted an old ambulance and they made it into a grip truck mm -hmm. and it's like, it was the most badass thing I've ever seen. It was like watching it. It's like, it literally, it's like an ambulance is built for this. Yeah. It's, it's like meant for it, you know, once it's not saving lives. Yeah. It's it, once it's decommissioned, it's, it's like, it's meant for filmmakers. 
So we were just like drooling over this this um, this video they had put out, which kind of like went viral, and you know people were like really stoked on it because it really hadn't been done. I hadn't seen it done before, mm -hmm. and it was like, oh yeah, that's that's what we need to do. We need to, we need to find an ambulance. We need to do the same thing, and so we started looking for ambulances in the area, and that became very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, not to find one, just to find one within our price range that was like old enough that we could afford it, but didn't have a crazy amount of miles on it. Mm -hmm. um, and that we knew that we could just tear apart and make it our own. Right. And we just, you know, we were looking for it. Couldn't, couldn't find one, couldn't find the right one. So uh, one day, I think Ben called, uh, Ben used to, Ben works with us. Um, good dude. Shout out to Ben. We'll have him on the podcast sometime as well. Mm -hmm. We'll have everybody on the podcast. Yeah. Um, ben finds their number or something on their website. The, the company that, that retrofitted the ambulance mm -hmm. and just calls them. It's just like, Hey, and we just called them honestly, just to kind of pick their brain. Like, Hey, what would you do differently? Um, you know, we're looking at doing this. Like what were some of the pros and cons? Like, do you still use it? Do you still like it? You know, should we do this? Honestly, just trying to get advice. Mm -hmm. And they were super cool, like super open and honest, gave us a ton of really good pointers and advice. And, uh, so we're like, cool, whatever. That was a call. Awesome kept our search going for an ambulance and just kept hitting walls. And in the mean, during the meantime, it was like, we were, we kept looking at that one ambulance. We're like, this thing is, this is the one. Like, yeah. I wonder if they'll sell it to us. Well, the problem was like, we, they bought the ambulance. They told us how much they bought it for. And since then, like overland vehicles had become such a big thing, you know, yeah. people building out like their campers and things like that. So the price of these ambulances had, like shot up. Right. So everything was so expensive. Like even these old shitty ambulances that like didn't even run, you know, they're more than what they paid for. Like, how did they get this deal? Right. Yeah. They were really hard to find. Yeah. yeah. They were, they became this weird niche thing that like people were living in them and all that stuff. Yeah. But, um, so yeah. So eventually we we're just like, well, what if we just reach out and see if they want to sell us theirs? And I remember we, we called them like on a Monday and they're like, they're really cool about it. Like, no, you know, I don't think we're ready to sell it. You know, it's, it's, it's got, I don't know if they said it has sentimental value, but I could sense that it probably does have sentimental sure. value to them. You know, it's like, it was something really cool that they did. It was a unique idea and I could, I could understand if they didn't want to get rid of it. Yeah. I'm like, all right, cool. So the following Monday, we're like, let's, let's uh, reach out to them again, let's see if they've changed their mind. So we just started every week. We would like, at that, we weren't calling them every week, but we'd email them just like, hey, just wanted to check in, see if you change your mind about it. Yeah. I think it was like a month after that first call that finally they're like, you know what? We're willing to sell it. We haven't been using it as much. We're going to, uh, they had bought, I think, another truck. Yeah. That they were using. Truck and trailer. Right. So they were willing to part with it. And we were stoked. We're like, that's awesome. Let's do this. So, um, they gave us a great price on it and we're super helpful. And now the problem of, all right, well, how are we going to get this thing? Mm -hmm. This thing's up in North Dakota. We're in Florida uh, and it's an ambulance that we've never driven. We don't, I mean, we trusted them in that the thing was drivable and, and all that, but yeah. someone had to get it. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> Morgan went and got so, it. Two days later, uh, I was on a flight to North Dakota and I flew up there and this is in like November. Yeah. So it's cold as hell. It's freezing up in North Dakota. It's snowing. Yeah. And um, yeah, I just flew up there, met the guys. Uh, they gave me a walkthrough of how to drive it, you know, it had of all these like switches, power switches to turn on and make sure you do this, make sure you don't do this. Kind of gave me the overview of all the compartments and everything that we might need to do that, you know, they had taken great care of it. Mm -hmm. Like it was in great shape. It was a 97 and like, it was in great shape. Yeah. But they had like lifted it with ridge grapplers and this thing was just like, it was badass. Like yeah. it was huge. But they were like, yeah, honestly, like when we thought about it, like over the last year, we've only put a hundred miles on the thing. And as much as we love it, they were moving to more of like a studio kind of setup. They had just bought a studio and they wanted to do a lot in there. So they're like, we're doing less on location. So we just bought a truck and trailer like for location stuff. And they're like, yeah, like, see you later you mm -hmm. know and like i just i took off and um yeah i drove from straight from north dakota back to florida uh in the ambulance and just slept in there overnight and i think it was a couple days of driving 
Um, you just had like a sleeping bag, right? Yeah, just like put a sleeping bag in the back, and it was like it was like a sleeping bag because they had spare tires too. Uh, oh, that's right. You remember? Yeah, yeah. So the spare tires were in there, so I'd like lay the spare tires out and sleep on the spare tires <laughs> on the sleeping bag, and um, yeah, it was it was crazy because it's you know it's an ambulance, it's a lifted ambulance that you're yeah. driving across the country. Yeah. Um, and I was just solo, like just just driving it, and I remember. I remember it being freezing cold, it was snowing, ice on the roads. Thing handled really well with all that obviously being so heavy. Mm -hmm. But that was an exhausting trip. Like yeah. it was just so exhausting just trying to get it, get it back. And we had a Yeah, we had like a film premiere that night. Yeah. The night you got back. Yep. We had a, a documentary that we had shot that was that was uh premiering. Yeah. And I literally drove straight to the premiere. In the ambulance. I'll never yeah. forget it, man. Yeah. Seeing you pull up in that thing. It yep. was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, the thing worked out great. Um, overall, like, just back to what I was saying about forgetting things on shoots and having to load in, load out, all that stuff, man. It just, it, our workflow improved immediately. It yeah. was like, we have everything we need. Everything has a place. And, you know, and it's all, like, they had done, they did a great job. We pretty much stuck to the plan. Like, the way that they had it set up you know, even like where they kept certain things, it all made sense. Yeah. It was like, Hey, we're just, we're just going to pretty much copy what they did Yep, and, you know, take their logo off, put ours on. Yep. And, you know, so it worked out really nice. Uh, it hasn't been perfect. Obviously yep. nothing is, uh, <laughs> we pretty recently, we, we took a trip up to, uh, the Adirondacks in upstate New York and we decided to drive there cause we got the ambulance. Of course, let's put some miles on it and let's mm -hmm. drive up there. So, uh, we took the crew. It was, th I think, it was three of us in the in the ambulance, and then it was uh, another car. We had a couple other people in there, following us up, and it's a, it's a it's a haul. I mean, it's mm -hmm. I think it took us like twenty six hours. I think to get up there, it took us longer to get back. Yeah. So you and I just you know I drive twelve hours, then you drive twelve hours. Cool, that's the trip. Mm -hmm. We did the same thing on the way back, mm -hmm. but on the way up, you know, the Adirondacks. There's, there's a lot of it's mountains, you know, it's, it's very hilly. Yep. The, the truck got us up there. We were pretty much like, I think we were maybe an hour away from where we were, where we were going. Yeah. We were in the city, right? Oh yeah. We were right outside that. New York city. Oh yeah. So before that, so this is 4th of July weekend. Yeah. We somehow take some detour. I think someone, someone wanted food or something. I don't remember exactly, but we ended up in in like Manhattan, I guess it was, it would have been Brooklyn. Yeah. We were on the Brooklyn side. We were in Brooklyn during rush hour traffic on like the Friday of, of 4th of July weekend. Mm -hmm. It was standstill traffic and we're in this massive truck and it's like, how did this happen? Like, how do we get, we're literally in the worst place you can be. We're trying to go upstate and here we are yeah. making this detour in Brooklyn. So that was fun. Yeah. So after that, we, once we <laughs> figured out where we're going, um, once we get up into the mountains, now we're, you know, there's, it's just a lot of hills. Um, it's probably three or three AM, four AM, maybe it was, it was late in the evening. I remember. Yeah. Remember this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But before that, the, we had the transmission thing. Right? Well, yeah, yeah, that's right. That so. was in like New Jersey or something, right? When the the trans transmission thing. The happened? transmission started. So like a little overdrive. I yeah. remember driving and the little overdrive light was flicking and I was yeah. like, oh, I've seen this before. That's not good. Yeah. It's not supposed to be flickering like that. So it was going, I think it started somewhere. Yeah. Probably in, in Jersey or something. And it stayed like that. And as I was driving the thing, just, it wasn't revving correctly. You know, it yeah. was just like high rev all the time. It wouldn't gear down. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, great. Something's going on with this. And we're like, we still got some miles left mm -hmm. and it's, getting dark and we're just like all right hopefully this thing gets us there yeah then it's like i don't know i think it was it was late at night i don't know if it was 2 3 a.m whatever it was yeah and the adirondacks is like upstate new york like yeah. you're close to canada there's nothing around no the area we were into was pitch black pitch black and steep hills and we're we're driving this thing and we were running out of gas like we had almost no gas in the tank and there's not a gas station around so we're looking, we're trying to find a gas station close by and it's just like, all right, I don't know. I don't know. We found one eventually. 
got there, but it's the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. And we pulled up and it's just a ghost. Like there's nothing there. No one's, it's closed. So like we got out and like took a piss or whatever. And we're just like, I don't know if we're going to make it, yeah. but we got to try. <laughs> <laughs> I think you started driving at that point. Yeah. So I was dead. I was yeah. just so tired, man. I, so I think I got in the back and just went to sleep. Yeah. I was like, all right, wake me up. If you need anything. Let's hope, hopefully we get there. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was like 45 minutes left on the drive. And that thing was like, the overdrive wasn't working, so it was super hilly. Every time you were going uphill, it was just like revving like crazy. So you're using more, more gas. More gas, yeah, diesel. And then I would tr- basically I'd get up the hill and I'd throw it in neutral and just like coast down the <laughs> yeah, hill, yeah. And then back to you know like do that on every single hill. But yeah, it was like so creepy because it's just there's nobody around. There's no lights. Every gas station was dead closed. Wouldn't take a card. Try- kept trying. Kept trying. And it was like clearly below the E, mm-hmm. like, like way below the E. And it's like, it's like 4 a.m. And the crazy part is, is that, I know it must have been like 2.30 maybe, something like that. Yeah, because we, we woke up the next morning and started our shoot at like 3.30 a.m. Yeah. So yeah, it would have been We had like to be there. Yeah. Yeah, we had to be up and ready by 3.30 yeah. to start this long hike, Yeah. To, to film this hike in the dark. And so like- we're just like panicking. It's like, if we don't, if this thing runs, it running out of gas is one thing, you know, it's like you go knock on someone's door mm-hmm. and the next day, whatever. But it's like, we had a shoot. We were going straight from driving yeah. into that shoot. Yeah. Like if we don't make it, we don't get it. And it was a huge part of the production. Yeah. Like that, that. The moment. <laughs> it yeah. was the moment. It was like the, the climax of the film that we needed to get. So we were going straight into that. We got, ended up getting there. Like I'd, just we got lucky and we just didn't run out of gas somehow i don't was, know how dude, i was so confused when i woke up because i'm sleeping in the back of the truck and all of a sudden you just you know like when you're sleeping in a vehicle and it stops and that's what wakes you up yeah because you've been driving for so long it was that all of a sudden i'm like how the hell did we make it here yeah like, how did that happen <laughs> like there's no way it was it was it was on e before i went to sleep there's no way. And I knew how far away we were. Right. This just doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Somehow it just worked out. Yeah. Because <laughs> you didn't find gas. Nope. Didn't find gas. And we ended up like sleeping for like 45 minutes. Yeah. And then getting up and like. Oh, and then we didn't have gas to get to the mountain the next morning for that shoot. Right. So we, we had to do the same thing. We had to coast every hill. We'd mm-hmm. coast down and we barely just made it yep. to the trailhead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we got out. Did the shoot or whatever, and then so, and then we were able to coast down to a gas station from there. Yeah, after the shoot, mm-hmm. crazy. Can't yeah. believe it all worked out. It was nuts, man. That yeah. was crazy. That was a that was the first experience of taking that thing out of state, like yep. actually taking it on a trip. Well, and then That's- on the way back, so the transmission is screwed up. It was still drivable, but it was just not efficient. <laughs> we, we had to get a whole new transmission when we yeah, got back. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. Fast forward, we ended up replacing that transmission. Mm-hmm. Um, but the AC also went out on the way back too. Yeah. And it was hot. It was July or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so the AC went out. So we had no AC. And the whole plan too is like, all right, so, you know, you can only drive for so long. So we would each, like I said, we drive like half the day each, but- the plan is when you're not driving, you're sleeping because mm-hmm. we're just exhausted from the shoot. But trying to sleep in the back there with no AC and getting down into like Georgia and stuff, oh, man, it was so that hot. sucked so bad. It was so hot. Yeah, but it's a good story. Yeah, it's a hell of a story. And yeah. the truck has, other than those things, I mean, obviously, like you're gonna have problems with vehicles, whatever. Yeah, it's an old vehicle, you know. And then course. we just immediately put like three thousand miles on it or whatever, but that truck has been like a game changer for us. You yeah. know, it's got, the cool thing about it is, is like, like you said, it's it's basically outfitted for production. Like tons of compartments inside. Oddly enough, with like the 510 Pelican cases, there's like a compartment that perfectly fits three of them. Like it was made for it. It's so satisfying. I know. It's so satisfying putting those Pelican cases back in there. Yeah. It's like just perfect. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's got great. like all that stuff. It's got a big, long, uh, like bench on the side and inside of that bench, you can fit all your tripods and things like that. And then the best part about it is, well, it's got a, it's got a DIT station. It's got like a, a station with like a, like a desk and a chair back there. Yeah. Um, but the best part's the outside compartments. Yes. There's five outside compartments that hold C stands that hold a lot of things that you just need to grab. Like you can just 
you you know where everything is. You you organize the thing to where you, you can go tell somebody that it's in whatever cabin A or whatever, and they know exactly where that is and how to get it. And it's so convenient for yeah. productions. Yeah, that C stand holder is is a game changer. Yeah, and it has the the there's a wood box on the top with additional space for long items. So we mm -hmm. have like a combo stand up there and some piping and stuff up there. Yep. So yeah, it's it, the thing is it's perfect for production. Yeah. Yeah, it really has changed the way we do shoots. Mm -hmm. We just show up, we know where everything is, load out is, is a breeze, and you know, loading back up after the shoot is a breeze too. So yeah, yeah it worked out really nicely. Mm -hmm. I like that thing. Yeah. We have to get the siren fixed though, because that's not working anymore. And the PA, yeah. And the PA system. Yeah. <laughs> I had like a PA you could talk through. It was awesome. Yeah. Worked for like a week. Yeah. And then broke. That's right. Yeah. We got some things to fix, but it's been really good to us. Um, and it's the best part is like all your grip and stuff like that. Like it just stays in there. Yeah. Like we, we have it in like a storage, storage unit that's gated and locked up. And like, it was always so, it was like the worst part of a shoot. Cause you have like a 16 hour day, you get back to the office and like, you had to unload everything, yeah. whether it was in like the Xterra or the truck, it's like everything has to go back. And it's like another 40 minutes of just like lugging everything back and you're exhausted. And now it's like you pull out the memory cards, you pull out the few things you want to pull out and you lock everything up and you're done. Yeah. You just park it and it's good. Yeah. We do have a bit of an ant problem in there right now because oh, yeah. we park under this tree in the parking lot of this storage unit and I think the ants fall down. And so, yeah. You put a bug bomb in there and kill them all. Yeah. I haven't gone over there to look to see if it really worked. Yeah. They killed them. I don't know if they're back. Could be. Yeah. We'll see. See in the next shoot. Yeah. <laughs> see. <laughs> yeah. And that's pretty much all of our gear. I mean, now we're using, uh, we, we actually recently switched from uh, the Black Magics to the Sony FX6. Yep. So we're back in Sony land. Um, and that camera's been amazing. Mm -hmm. Just like, Beautiful image, uh, tons of dynamic range, internal NDs. Autofocus, great autofocus. Yeah. 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 That thing's been like a real game changer, especially for the documentary stuff. You know, like I've been out this summer uh, off and on traveling, uh, doing like a, a series, documentary series that we're working on. And it's just me solo. It's like a very run and gun thing. Um, super fun it's kind of fun to go back to that yeah. you know and just like shoot what's available you know right um but that that camera makes it so much easier mm -hmm. so much easier once like i kind of got the hang of it this is like kind of the first real shoot that i've really been able to get familiar with it but now understanding how it shoots and understanding like where my exposures need to be the ease of nd as things change as you move from interiors to exteriors like that camera is amazing yeah yeah <clears throat> it looks great yeah it's a solid little camera yeah yeah really happy with that thing mm -hmm. yeah for sure is there any other gear we need to talk about i think that pretty much covers it all yeah other than that it's just like a bunch of c stands and yeah boring stuff dolly metal just yeah. a bunch of metal yeah <laughs> <laughs> but that's really it it's not much like it's not a ton you know, it's a couple things that we really invested in. You know, I feel like investing in a good set of lenses, a good camera, some good lighting that's powerful enough to really do the job. Yeah. Um, and for us, the truck. Yeah. Like, that's really gotten us through everything. And we still rent from time to time. And, you know, the goal is to keep doing bigger productions that allow for you know, bigger equipment to, yeah. to continue to refine it. But for what we're doing right now, I feel like that serves us really, really well. Like we kind of, we've kind of put a halt on buying gear for the most part for now, just because like, yeah, there's more things we could do and there's things that could be better and there's more lights we could get to, to help the production. But for what we have right now, it's like, it's such a good, it's just like the basic utility of what we need. Right. And then you can rent outside of that. But like yeah. you said, if we need to do a shoot tomorrow, like we're ready. Mm -hmm. Everything's packed up. If someone calls us and we need to be there in two hours, then like we can be there. Yeah. Ready to go. Yeah. And that's like a game changer for us. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Again, gear is just, they're, they're tools, tools for creativity, you know? Yep. Just, I think that's, that's the focus. 
Yep. <laughs> the creative. Yep. Um, and those tools just help you get there. Yep. So cool. Well, I that's guess all. Till the next one. Bye. Cheers. How long was that one?